context of it. So let's go ahead and turn in our Bibles to Genesis chapter 33 as we continue our study through Genesis. If you're reading or watching or listening to the news at all, you know we are a world in crisis. All sorts of people debating the cause and the um, purposes or the problems and, that are uh, resulting in those crises. Lots of people offering their ideas about what can make it better. But what I'm observing is divorce rates continue to skyrocket. Kids turn to gangs for acceptance, to violence for respect. They turn to drugs for escape and immorality for intimacy. The government really doesn't have a solution because the government is made up of people just like us, sinners. And the just nature of power is power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And so they can talk about family values and offer suggestions and programs, but God's solution to the mess we're in is straightforward and simple. It's in a word, reconciliation. And when we're right with Him, we'll find a way to be right with others. And until we're right with Him, we will never be right with others. Now, if you've been studying through Genesis with us, you know that some 20 years earlier than this passage we're studying today, Esau had threatened to murder his brother. He was about as hot as you could get. Having been ripped off earlier for his birthright, now he was robbed of his blessing. As Jacob and his mom came in with this great masquerade, pretending to be actually his older brother, dressing in his smelly clothes, trying to imitate his voice, bringing the food his brother was supposed to bring, and obtaining the blessing by deceit. Well, Jacob hightailed it out of there at his mother's suggestion, has spent 20 years back with Uncle Laban, and now he's on the road home. And last time we saw the beginning of that trip, and today we find him actually meeting up with his brother. Well, if things are going to be right between Jacob and Esau, each of them are going to need a personal encounter with the Lord. And I want to show you how perfectly this passage fits into the coming holiday season as we contemplate meeting with family and loved ones and some who aren't so loved, but uh, those who we were just born among and raised among. And I know for many of you, that isn't exactly a, oh boy, can't wait situation. Lots of family relationships are strained. And while psychologists and sociologists debate the actual root causes and talk about programs or therapies to help people straighten out those problems, I want to tell you it's relatively simple. Without going all the way back in the past and figuring out every time you've been offended or hurt or wounded or, or victimized, you just need to know God's plan is a one-step program. Well, actually, it's a two-step. First, get right with Him, and then you'll be motivated and empowered to get right with others. You may be thinking, well, wait a minute. I'm not the one who's done anything wrong. I'm the wounded party. I want to lay something out for you that's kind of interesting. You who are here, you who are tuning in, you who are listening. The Bible says if your brother sins against you, go to him and tell him the fault between you and him alone. Possibly the most disobeyed command of Jesus in all scripture. Just you and the offending party alone. Tell him the fault. Go in a spirit of meekness. Go with the goal of restoration. And he says it's quite possible you'll restore your brother. On the other hand, the Bible says if your brother has something against you, you who are here, you who are listening, you who are convicted, you go to your brother. You're thinking, well, wait a minute. It's me no matter what. If I offend them, I got to go. If they offend me, I got to go. Yeah, here's why. Because God always makes the first move in restoration. 
And if you're listening to God and obeying God, you're going to be making the first move in restoration. Well, we're going to see that perfectly portrayed, beautifully spelled out for us as we get into this passage today. Genesis 32, Jacob had a personal encounter with the Lord. He was reconciled to the Lord, brought back, if you will, restored to a right relationship. And now he is not only motivated, but empowered and and walking with a hope that he can and will be reconciled to his brother Esau. And so today, if you've never committed your life to the Lord Jesus, if you've never humbled yourself before God and said, Lord, I'm a sinner and I, I recognize you're not. You're holy, you're pure, you're perfect. And I understand my sin has separated me from you. And I see how it's separating me from others. Lord, forgive me that sin. I want a right relationship with you. And as you get it right this way, it's going to be much easier to deal this way. Well, in Genesis 22 then, we saw Jacob had a change of heart. And we saw that God changed his name to represent that change. No longer Jacob. No longer conniver, sneaky, con man, thief. No, now he would be called Israel, prince of God, and governed by God, ruled by God. So in chapter 33, we find him now reconciled and restored to fellowship with his brother. Jacob, we read, lifted his eyes and looked, and there Esau was coming. And with him were 400 men, so he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maidservants. And he put the maidservants and their children in front, Leah and her children behind, and Rachel and Joseph last. Then he crossed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near his brother. Now this is sort of a side trip, and I don't want to get hung up on it, but if you have a bunch of kids... I want to suggest that if you're ever in a crisis, putting the ones you favor less out front isn't going to exactly work out best for later relationships. And that's sort of what happens here. He looks at his kids and he thinks, oh, I got 11 of these guys. Those two have been trouble. Put them out front. Uh, little Joseph, I like him. Put him in the back. But, but really, you've got to see it. This was an absolutely foolish and futile attempt to save and deliver those kids. If Esau's heart were intent on wiping out Jacob and his family, he had 400 armed men with him. He would have no problem pursuing them and doing it. Jacob's only hope was that God had dealt with Esau, even as he was dealing with Jacob. And we're going to see that's exactly what happened. Before we do, though, I want you to go over to the book of 2 Corinthians If you're not familiar with your New Testament, then you might just listen on and check it out later. Jot a note, 2 Corinthians. But I want to show you something so you can see that this is an established biblical pattern as far as making things right, reconciling broken relationships, restoring broken relationships. First of all, it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Did I tell you that? Probably would have helped, right? Verse 17, and I'll give you a second to get there. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So if things are going to be right, the first thing that has to happen is we need to be new in him. And we see that in Jacob's life, don't we? He has a new nature. He has a new name. He is motivated now by love for the Lord and love for his brother. And so it goes on here in 2 Corinthians to say, Now all things are of God, and he who has reconciled to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 21 tells us the same thing and tells us really how he went about that reconciling us. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now you might be thinking, that verse sounds familiar to me. And I'm kind of new to this. Well, we sing it. 
And one of the things that we try to do as much as possible is sing songs right out of Scripture. Why? There's something about hanging a verse on a melody that helps it stick in our minds. I mean, how many of you would do anything to just be able to forget the Gilligan's Island theme? Or, or, or the, you know, uh, who, who are those guys, Uncle Jed and, and uh, the, the, who? Yeah, the Clampets. I call my niece that, Allie Mae Clampets. She doesn't like it much. But, uh, but anyway, those themes, man, you hear them, they get in your head, you can never forget them again. So if that happens to useless information, think how wonderful it is when you're processing good information. Well, here's the process. He chooses to move toward us in reconciliation. God always initiates. And then we're told he's reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. How did he do it? He made him who knew no sin be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. And having been reconciled now, we're told in verse 18, the latter part, we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. What this suggests is that God moved toward us, revealed his holiness, our sinfulness, his plan for our salvation, and having reconciled us, restored us to a right relationship, he says, now you're agents for me. And he's not looking for secret agents out there. See, he wants people who will boldly say, God's done a work in my life. I want you to know it. I want you to examine it. And I want you to know that, that I love you and, and I have a heart for you and I want to see you restored and I want to see you in fellowship with God and with me. And as we begin to function that way, and listen, Thanksgiving right around the corner, Christmas right behind it, we're going to have opportunity to once again face those relatives. Some we've wounded, some have wounded us. Some of us have misrepresented the Lord. Listen, it is the most natural thing in our early zeal to go to our parents and say, hey, you know, you're going to hell and I'm on my way to heaven. And I've noticed that parents usually don't take that as, you know, oh, well, thanks for sharing, son. They usually act offended when you come with that message. And it may be that a little warmth and a little tact and giving them a little bit of credit for whatever gains they have made or things they have done could be part of the road to reconciliation. You see, if we're going to work for Jesus, we need to be more like Jesus. And here's what the Bible says. We need to speak the truth, yes, but we need to speak it in love. It's got to be his message coupled with his nature. We can't just blast people with the truth. We need to go with a spirit of meekness and humility and restore those who are in opposition. Well, that's part of what's going on here. In fact, that is God's plan. That is God's heart. Reconciliation, restoration of the sinner. Well, back to Genesis chapter 33. We see that in this move, Jacob comes, he puts his family out there, and then he goes first. I like that. Now, his faith isn't perfect. And whose is? He's a guy that is trusting the Lord, that does love the Lord. He knows he's been reconciled and blessed by the Lord. And so he lines his family up, and then he goes first, verse 3, crossing over, bowing himself down to the ground seven times until he came near his brother. Now, there are a couple things we need to touch on here. One is the Scriptures tell us in Proverbs sixteen seven. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. And we know that Jacob was pleasing the Lord. He loved the Lord. He had responded to the Lord. He was grateful for all the Lord had done. He had acknowledged that all he had came by the grace of God. And so what God's looking for from us and wanting to do in us is he wants us to come to that point where we really do love him with all that's in us, love him with all our heart and trust him with all our heart. And Jacob's still in process as we are, but for this reconciliation to happen, Jacob needed to demonstrate that he was a changed man. 
And the first area that he demonstrates that as he comes face to face with Esau is in this area of the birthright. He'd ripped him off for it, taken advantage of him early on for it. And now as he comes, the birthright actually representing the headship of the home, being number one, not number two, the double portion. He comes and he bows himself seven times before his brother. This is how you paid homage to a king. And what's he doing is he's saying, listen, it's you and it's yours. I know what I was. I know what I've done. But I just want to bow before you, humble myself before you. And I want you to know that I honor you and you can have whatever God has for you. Now, the real irony of this whole thing, and it is ironic, is God had already purposed that Jacob would have the birthright and the blessing, which we'll discuss once again in a moment. But Jacob went about obtaining it through his own fleshly efforts. And you'll never, you will never inherit God's blessings through your fleshly conniving. You'll never accomplish God's purposes and the energies of your flesh. And so Jacob's attempts to do it his way were completely, completely wasted. Any attempt to protect and watch over his family by lining them up in one long line, hey, that was a waste as well. God had worked in Jacob's heart, and we see that now. But then we need to acknowledge that restoration, listen, it's a two-way street. It's a two-way street. And the Proverbs tell us as well that the Lord has the king's heart in his hand. He says it's like a river of water. He turns it whichever way he desires. So here we see Jacob treating Esau like a king. How's Esau going to respond? Well, verse 4 tells us he ran to meet him. He embraced him. He fell on his neck and kissed him. And they wept. Esau's heart had been changed as well. And the king's heart, as I shared, it's in the hands of the Lord. Now, if Jacob's fear was a hindrance to restoration, and certainly it could have been, what would have hindered Esau from restoration? Well, there's a whole list of things. And if you've ever been hurt, burned, victimized, taken advantage of, especially by those close to you, then you need to hear this part carefully. Esau had every reason to hate Jacob. Esau had every reason to be bitter toward Jacob. The threats that he made, they were, man, some of them righteous threats because Jacob had not only burnt Esau, he burnt his father and ripped them both off, lied and connived and misrepresented the Lord in that whole situation. But here's what I see God doing in Esau's heart. The bitterness is washed away. The anger, the frustration, the hatred, the revenge, it's been washed away. He's got a heart of compassion, of mercy, of love, of grace. And so we see Esau running to meet him, embracing him, fell on his neck. It doesn't sound that good, but it actually is a good thing. Every time you read it in Scripture, whether here or when Joseph later will meet up with his father, or when the prodigal's father sees him coming, humbled before him, even as Esau was here, humbling himself, I'm not worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. He runs to him. He embraces him, falling on his neck. Same exact phrase. Kissing him, weeping over him, restoring him. But how did God change Esau's heart? Well, I believe in the same way that Jacob wrestled with the Lord, the Lord revealed who he was and what he was. The Lord had been wrestling with Esau as well. And you've got to know that if God's moving on your heart to restore relationships, he'll be working on the other side as well. He never does half a work. Our do God does all things well. It's always the complete picture. 
And so as we contemplate again, getting together with family and such, let me throw a couple scriptures at you that I think could be helpful. The Bible says, let no root of bitterness spring up, lest many be defiled. Did Esau have a right to be bitter? Absolutely. What does the scripture say? Don't let that root of bitterness take hold. Don't let it spring up. Don't let it reproduce. Why? Many will be defiled. What does it mean to be defiled? It means we're rendered unfit for worship or service. And I've watched people that loved the Lord, that worshiped the Lord, that were serving the Lord, have some experience with another believer or with someone who was an unbeliever. And I've watched them grow bitter and actually start to to resent and hate that person. And what ends up happening, not only does the person who's bitter stop worshiping and stop serving, but those people closest to them, that bitterness spills off and out into their lives as well. And you see whole families out of fellowship, whole families that used to worship and serve the Lord together, backslidden. So make sure it's not you that's causing it. You know, there's a scripture that gives us some hope, even if we're absolutely convinced some relationships are beyond repair. It says, as much as is possible for you, be at peace with all men. It doesn't say they'll all make peace with you. It doesn't guarantee their response. But it says, make sure you're not the reason the relationship's strained. Don't let your bitterness over the past Don't let your anger, your frustration, the hatred that can result from that, that desire to get even and teach them a lesson and show them they're not going to treat you that way. All of that misrepresents the goodness and mercy of the Lord. And so wives, husbands, parents, children, brothers, sisters, listen, unforgiveness Bitterness leads to torment. Unforgiveness, bitterness defiles. It will keep you from worshiping. It will keep you from serving. It'll keep you from experiencing all God's intended for you. Now, if you're still not convinced, one last little thing, and then we'll look at more of the story here. Relatively straightforward and wonderful story. Reconciliation, redemption, restoration, It's a happy ending. You don't always get that, even in Scripture. But Jesus tells a parable about a man who owed some bucks. The the context of it's kind of interesting because Peter comes to him and he says, Hey, listen, how many times are we actually supposed to forgive people anyway? Uh, Like seven? Would that do? And Peter's actually going well beyond what any religious leader of the day would have said. What's the saying, burn me once, shame on you, burn me twice, shame on me? Uh, You know, at least that's what I was taught. So maybe once we forgive and twice, okay, but I'm going to keep my eye on you. But three times, hey, we're done. And that's so much of how we operate in our lives and our interaction with other people. Even Christians do it. So Peter comes and he says, Hey, how many times should I forgive? How about seven times, Lord? And I'm sure he's just, you know, chest out and looking around to see. Just wait till he says how amazing that is, you know, in front of the other disciples. And the Lord says, no, how about 70 times seven? I bet their mouths dropped. I bet their eyes were this big. 490 times? Man, I had Peter at two. I was thinking one more. I wouldn't have to forgive him anymore. No, I'm 490 times. Oh, man, are you kidding? What's he saying? It's infinite, really. I I sort of have some insight into all of this because it talks about how many times should I forgive my enemies? You know, Jesus says at one point that your enemies may very well be those of your own household. That was true for him. That's been true for many. And he's saying, how many times do you need to forgive your family? See, I think you almost have to be family to get to offend a person more than seven times. Because usually you're just written off long before that. But Thanksgiving's coming and we're going to be there. Why? It's tradition. We can't not show. And Christmas is going to happen and we're going to be there. Why? Because families get together. 
But what we want is a restoration of relationship. We want it to be a joyous and wonderful time together. So Jesus says to him, listen, there was this guy and he owed this other guy about a million bucks. I'm paraphrasing, but this is a very accurate paraphrase. He owed this guy about a million bucks and the guy came and he said, well, just sell him and all he has in his family. And he threw himself at his feet and begged mercy. And he said, OK, I'll just forgive you the whole thing. And then he, that servant who was forgiven all, went out and found another who owed him, the guy owed him some serious money, about a third of a year's wages, three, four months pay. And he says, give me all you owe me, choking the guy. And the guy says, I just don't have a way to pay. He falls at his knees and says, have mercy, I'll, I'll, I'll pay. And he says, no, instead he throws him into the jail. Now, when the servants of that master saw what happened, they went back to the master and says, see what this guy's done? And it said, he brought the first before him and said, you wicked servant, I forgave you all. Should you not have forgiven this debt as well? And then it says he handed him over to the tormentors, to the torturers. And I have watched people who are bitter, who are filled with hatred, who are unforgiving. And listen, it's a tormented lifestyle. Sometimes the person you're bitter against doesn't even know. You're so good at hiding it. So all of the tor torment is yours. You're, you're not even getting the pleasure of making them miserable. And so the goal isn't, and I'm not suggesting, hey, make them miserable, you know, share the pain. No, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is you don't have to be miserable anymore. You don't have to carry around that bitterness. Once you reconcile with the Lord, once you realize all of your sins are forgiven. Listen, when Jesus said 490, he has done it. And he has done it to the 10th power. He has forgiven you every thought, every word, every action, every attitude. There's nothing you've done to sin against him and others that when you came and said, Lord, cleanse me, forgive me, restore me, he does it. And now all he's asking is that we become agents of that same mercy, of that same forgiveness, of that same grace. Well, note that that's what's happening here. He comes to Esau, Jacob, trembling and fearful. Did he trust the Lord? Yes, but he didn't trust Esau. But Esau, man, he'd had an encounter with the Lord too. Because he comes... He runs toward him, embraces him, falls on his neck, kisses him. They weep together. He lifts his eyes and sees the women and children and says, Who are these with you? And Jacob responds in verse 5, The children whom God has graciously given your servant. You know, he calls Esau Lord. He pays homage to him, bowing before him. He says, Hey, I'm your servant and all I have is by the grace of God. You see that heart attitude that can restore relationships, that can humble itself, so beautifully demonstrated in Jacob's life. Then as the maidservants come near and their children, they bow, and then Leah and her children, they bow, and then finally Rachel and Joseph, and they bow. And here's a good example. Listen, children will follow their parents' example. Children do follow father and mother's example. And they'll follow your bad and your good. And so here, we'll find many times these guys acting out, being the kind of connivers and deceivers and rip-offs that they saw their dad really was. But we also see them now imitating his humility, bowing before Esau, paying homage to Esau. So he says, what do you mean by all these company and and he said, they're to find favor in the sight of my Lord, verse 8. But Esau says, hey, I've got all I need. You keep what you have for yourself. But Jacob said, no, please, if I've now found favor in your sight, receive my present from my hand. Inasmuch as I've seen your face as though I'd seen the face of God and you were pleased with me, please take my blessing that is brought to you because God has dealt graciously with me and because I have enough and he urged him and he took it. Now, I told you early on, he'd reconciled this matter of the birthright simply by humbling himself and bowing before Esau, calling him 
his Lord, making himself Esau's servant. And now he deals with the blessing. Note the words in verse 11. Please take my blessing. That which he connived for, conned for, ripped off for. Now he recognizes. It never happened by all of that. He says, look it, God has dealt graciously with me. And I think it's important, brothers, sisters, that we realize if we've done something shady and come out ahead in the deal, that wasn't God blessing our disobedience or our dishonesty. That was God blessing us in spite of who we are and what we do. And we just need to know that every good and perfect gift comes down from God. And that's what Jacob has learned. So he says, look at the birthright deal. He doesn't have to use the word. It's obvious. And then it's like the blessing thing. Hey, I just want you to have what I have. Now listen, 550 animals is no small fortune. He was virtually giving his brother what would amount to hundreds of thousands and beyond dollars worth of assets were that to happen today and so what he's saying is look i don't need it i don't have to hang on to it god just gives me what he wants me to have i hope you've come to that point in your walk with him if you're young in the lord god wants to bring you there where you just rest and relax and know okay i'll just do what god gives me to do and i'll trust him to provide all that he intends for me to have well jacob comes and this is a practical restitution often something that we're guilty of failing to uh, accomplish as believers we know that god just forgives everything and we figure people ought to too but if you've taken advantage of someone and it's hurt them in a practical and material way you should make restitution you should go and repay them whatever you cost them And when you begin to do that kind of stuff, they're going to take note. They're going to want to know, what's this about? Now, what's your angle? What's this? What are you trying to do here? And you're going to be able to say, listen, God's been so gracious to me. I just want you to have what I took. I want you to have more than what I took. I want you to have the birthright. I want you to have the blessing. I want you to experience God's grace at my hands. Well, Esau at this point down in verse 12 says, hey, let's just head home together. Jacob says, no, the, the, the kids are tired. The livestock's tired. We're just going to hang here for a while. So Esau offers to leave behind some help to protect and watch over him. And he says, no, that's not necessary. And, and then Esau goes home and Jacob actually goes another direction. Now, I don't really have a big handle on that, any special insight into it. We don't know that they didn't get together later, but for a season, Rather than going with Esau or following Esau as he said he would, he instead journeys another direction. And we're going to find when we pick up next time, Jacob in a place called Shechem. And we're going to find that even as Lot moved towards Sodom, now Jacob moving towards Shechem wasn't really a good idea. I believe he should have been heading back to Bethel, the house of God, the place where he last saw the miraculous power and heard the voice and knew that God was there with and for him. But but he does a couple things right. We saw the sort of what was wrong and what was right last time. We see the same thing now. He's not totally straight with his brother at this point. He heads a direction opposite of where he said he was going to go. But when he gets there, he does build an altar. And altars in the Scripture always remind of us at least two things first of all worship he was saying lord thank you for reconciling me to my brother he was probably saying lord thanks my brother didn't kill me lord thanks that i didn't get what i deserved in fact that's what mercy is if you've ever wondered or wanted a biblical definition of mercy it's not getting what you deserve grace on the other hand goes even further it blesses the undeserving it not only doesn't punish and give what's deserved 
but blesses instead. And I believe that that's what Jacob's about at this point. He is worshiping God. He builds an altar to thank God, to praise God, to just say, God, you're so good. And he calls that altar God, the God of Israel. Now, there's no nation of Israel yet, no kingdom of Israel. He just had his name changed to Israel. And he has a new nature reflecting that name change. But he says, you're God, but you're not just God out there anymore. You are the God of this new man, this new creature in Christ. You are the God of the man you're making me, of Israel. Well, if, if altars remind us of worship, they also remind us of sacrifice. Every altar built where something was offered unto the true and living God was pointing us forward to the ultimate sacrifice Jesus would make in order for there to be reconciliation, restoration, a reuniting of relationship with God. And so as we look back at altars, those altars were actually pointing forward to the cross. And this is how it works. Today, if you've never been reconciled to God, if you're not born again of His Spirit, He says you're dead in trespasses and sin. Oh, alive physically, maybe catching on intellectually. But spiritually, He says you're in need of the life that He imputes when you realize you're a sinner and confess that sin has defiled you. You are unfit for worship. You're unfit for service. You have no chance of pleasing God until you take step one, which is to come to the cross and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You see, it wasn't Jacob's gifts that made things right with Esau. Jacob offered those gifts because it was right for him to do so. But he was made right because God had dealt with Esau's heart and God had dealt with Jacob's heart. If God's dealing with your heart, know this. Jesus died for your sins. And when he says you can be forgiven, he's talking about everything you ever thought, every word you ever spoke, every attitude you ever exhibited, every sin you ever committed. And if you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus, he wants you to experience that forgiveness and that cleansing. And if, in fact, you do, two things will happen. Beyond, beyond that miracle of you being born again, a new man, a new woman, a new person in Christ, you'll then have a motivation to forgive those who've sinned against you. Why? You'll be in the place of that servant, forgiven all. Once more, God will empower you to be merciful, to be gracious, to be forgiving. How can he do it? as you see him upon the cross, as you hear, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do, as you hear him and see him promise that thief nailed on the cross beside him, saying, today you'll be with me in paradise. Listen, forgiveness is absolute. He's willing, he's wanting to forgive, to restore. So if you, believer or unbeliever, recognize you're alienated, no, you're not just alienated because sin's in the world or because people took advantage of you or because you're a victim. You're alienated because of your own sin. And you can find forgiveness today by confessing that you're a sinner in the sight of a holy God. Lord, I pray for every person you've drawn here and how blessed I am to be able to open your word and Declare that you are a merciful and patient, long-suffering, forgiving God. But Lord, we know that as you extend your hand of forgiveness, as you, Lord, reveal your plan for our redemption and our restoration, you won't force anyone to even ask. And so I pray that you'd tug at hearts today. And for any and all of you who've never given your life to the Lord Jesus, listen, this is the only plan God has for your salvation. It is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. But he who confesses his sin, turns from it, is cleansed of it, forgiven it. God says, hey, the judgment, it happened on the cross. Jesus became sin for us died in our place, 
took the punishment due us that we might experience his forgiveness and his mercy. And so today, first of all, if you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus, while every head's bowed and every eye's closed, I'd ask believers to be praying for every believer in our midst or every unbeliever, excuse me, because there's a spiritual battle that happens at this moment. And some are thinking, man, I should take this offer. I should act upon it. And there's a still small voice saying, hey, you have plenty of time. You don't know that to be true. The scripture says today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Today is the day of salvation. Some of you are thinking, man, I should deal with this. And, and you're hearing a still voice within saying, you'll never make it. You're too far gone. You've done too much. But the scripture says, he who begins the good work will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. You can't be too far gone, too great a sinner to be forgiven, or you wouldn't be here. God's all about restoration, and he's offering you complete and total pardon of sin today. But you have to reach out and say yes. And if you're ready to do that, and you've never before been born again, I'd ask you to raise your hand and hold it high. Allow me the privilege of praying for you. God bless you, brother. Others here today who haven't made that commitment, if you know these things are true, God wants to deal with your heart. He wants you to experience that freedom from the guilt and the pain and the shame of sin. Freedom from bitterness and hatred and all that's in a man. Anyone else? Have you given your life to the Lord Jesus? Are you ready to open your heart to him today? Lord, we look for hands. You read hearts. And I know that lots of us, Lord, have people to reconcile with. And it's easy for us to put it off or think it won't happen. But you've given us such a clear picture today, Lord, that it's what you're about and it's what you're desiring. And I pray that in your perfect timing, as you soften and prepare our hearts, that you do the same with those we're alienated from and that there'd be no division, that there'd be no bitterness, that there'd be no hatred or vengeance in our hearts, but just your mercy and your goodness and your grace. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. And any who'd want to pray along, pray these words out, out loud after me. Heavenly Father, Thank you for revealing your heart. You're so merciful. And I know you want me to be the same. You're so forgiving. And I know you want me to be the same. Lord, I pray you'd give me the will to do your will. And you'd give me a heart like yours. Help me to see people through your eyes and treat them the way you've treated me. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's all stand, you guys.